Um, my name is Svetlana Stevenson and I am one of the conveners of uh, this forum and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's event. Uh, uh, Dr. Bo Tang will introduce the event and all the speakers uh, and uh, before we start I would like to encourage you to think about uh, the uh, possible proposals for the next uh, academic year. We will be shortly sending uh, an invitation to submit the proposals and uh, as, uh, similarly to this year we would like to have a series of workshops which would be interdisciplinary and uh, involve uh, collaboration between people from different schools or from different subject uh, areas within one school. Uh, typically three to four speakers and I'm pleased to say that there will be uh, a modest budget uh, to support participation of uh, external speakers preferably from the UK in face-to-face -face events so, so online and face-to-face -face, you know it depends uh, obviously uh, upon the COVID situation but also uh, sometimes uh, actually if we have an online event then, then, then uh, there are uh, you know, better chances for people to participate uh, fr from various places in the UK and, and uh, from the university as well. So the deadline for, for the proposals will be the 17th of September, but in any case I will send an email to you or to all members of staff in our university, but if you have any um, you know, ideas that you would like to discuss uh, either with me or with Gary McLean, uh, please uh, feel free to contact us and if you need any advice on potential collaborators, you know, we'll, we'll be very happy to try to organize your workshop with you. And now uh, I'm very pleased to, to uh, hand, uh, hand over to Bo, who, who will be chairing this event. Uh, thanks very much, Bo. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Svetlana. So welcome everybody to today's um, Interdisciplinary Research Forum on um, home and homemaking. Uh, we're very delighted to have you here today. Um, so I would like to first welcome all of our speakers. We have five speakers today um, who will do short presentations and then hopefully we'll have um, a good amount of time for discussion afterwards. Um, so we have um, in order um, Professor Br Patrick Britbrill. Um, unfortunately, he is unable to make it today, but um, Matthew Barrick has um, kindly offered to present on his behalf and he operates, uh, Patrick operates under the pseudonym of Bob and Reversa Smith. Um, we'll then have a presentation from Nitin Butler and Samed Hagar, um, followed by a presentation by um, Sandra Danique Volker. Um, we'll then hear from Dr. Ignacia Ossel Vermeeren. And finally, um, a, a presentation from Dr. Matthew Barrick as well. Um, we also have joining us um, Dr. Vitri Chedakali, who will um, act as respondent uh, for today's session. So I think there were some guidelines that were already posted um, whilst you were waiting earlier about keeping your microphones off. Um, so I just wanted to remind everybody about that. Um, of course, if you have a question, um, please raise your hand or, or type it in the chat and I'll try and pick those up um, at the end of the presentations. Uh, for the speakers, um, you have 15 minutes each and I will um, let you know if we're approaching 15 minutes. So without um, further ado, let me please um, introduce to you the first uh, speaker, um, who is Matthew Barrick, um, but he will be um, he will be presenting Patrick's um, presentation and um, Patrick is an artist and educator in London um, and, and a lecturer at the London Met uh, professor at London Metropolitan University so um, over to you Matthew thank you very much uh, Bo I'm going to share my screen now we have a very slight complication with these uh, with the, with this uh, presentation because uh, it includes embedded videos uh, and I'm going to switch between me and Bo when we get to the videos uh, because uh, Collaborate won't play them directly. So uh, here we go. Um, as Bo said, 
uh, Patrick is um, uh, Pat Patrick is a, a teacher here at London Met in the School of Art, Architecture and Design. He's also uh, a very eminent artist. Um, he uh, is very, very well known uh, and a royal academician. Um, and amongst his best known works are Make Art Not War, Letter to Michael Gove, and this one, The Secret to a Good Life. Uh, he, his art practice is very much at the intersection of art, uh, fine art and activism. He uses sign writing to, uh, to bring very political and people-centered messages to uh, his audience. Um, and this work that we are going to be talking about today is very much in that spirit. Um, this is the shape of what uh, I'm going to share with you today. Uh, the second and f fourth item, the making of a secret to a good life, and Bob and Roberta Smith live from the RA are videos. So at that point, Bo will step in and play them for you. Um, okay, and in fact, we're gonna start with that film. So Bo, would you run the first film, which is called The Making of the Secret to a Good Life, which is an exhibition uh, that Patrick um, uh, convened at the Royal Academy in 2018. It's fairly self-explanatory from the video. So go ahead, Bo, thank you. I'm guessing it's not possible to share your sound as well, Bo. Do you want to unmute and see if that works? Apologies, that, mm -hmm. Let me start that again. <laughs> Don't worry. What's the pencil mean to you? Um, God. Um, pencil means uh, opportunity to create something interesting. <laughs> what does a pencil mean to you, Mum? Communication. Mm, that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> my ideas to you. Hmm. It's hard to really think about it as a group show, but it is a collaborative ensemble activity. It's a sort of family effort, really. It's really an homage to Bob's mom, Deirdre Borlase. Deirdre met Bob's dad, Frederick Bell, when they went to the Royal College together and they fell in love, they got married, they were both very um, prolific artists, painters. Where Fred then progressed in his career, Deirdre, she had her studio at home and she continued to work, but she brought up the family, she took care of the kids. And it's really the lament to what happens to the difference between a female and a male artist through that period of time. It's a meditation one who gets to make art, who gets to be part of the academy in some sort of way, or who, or more generally, who gets to get their work out there. You'll see four sculptures, which are like totem poles, really. They're various different characters in relationship to the RA. Two of them are collaborations with Gatta and myself one of which is of Angelica Kaufman, who was the first female Royal Academician. So when you look at the sculpture that we did together, that's her head, that's Angelica Kaufman, but her body is made of 14 other women artists that I find inspiring. People like um, Edmonia Lewis, she was an American who was alive during the Civil War and the end of slavery, but became successful in Italy and lived her, the end of her life in Italy, and she's incredibly inspiring, but why don't we know who she is? She was black and she was a woman. And so it's, it's this kind of conversation. So my collaboration is an uh, exploration of how ephemera can be used to create some awareness of these women's lives who have been marginalised. And so we created a piece of ephemera, a fanzine, about Mary Moser. We pasted the pages of the fanzine that I made on the sculpture itself. So that's kind of where the collaborative aspect comes in. And who is Mary Moser? She was the second female Royal Academician. And then there wasn't another female Royal Academician for nearly 200 years, which that is was 117 years. 100 years. <laughs> well, there's, there's a number, but, but too many years. Yeah. So. This installation really starts with the idea of my mother you know, showing me how to draw, really. It starts with this idea that she's saying, 
you know, the secret to life is to get a good pencil. Uh, uh, and she taught me how to draw by telling me how to draw a Christmas pudding and by trying to draw the custard first and then drawing in the pudding and then drawing in the plate and, you know, an arts and invitation. She said, we're going to invite all these people to the dinner. And uh, that idea about art being about making your mark and that she felt that she had to make her mark. And I think that's something that's also through these other sculptures, you know, this idea of all these 15 women artists that you've chosen to paint and that are with your, um, your fans. It's about art's ability to, uh, to emancipate people, really. So I hope that's what people might get from the exhibition. <laughs> Thank you, Bo. Matthew, are you on mute? Sorry, yes. So that hopefully gives you a good idea of what the exhibition was about. It was this idea uh, of a tribute to Patrick Brill's mother, uh, Bob and Roberta Smith's mother, Deirdre Borlasi, in relation to the Royal Academy, the, this august art institution at the center of, uh, of the art uh, institution in the UK. And um, very much what the intention was uh, for uh, in the artwork was not only to critique the institution of art, um, uh, specifically from a gender perspective, but also to critique the institutional dimension of the Royal Academy and to situate in this room where the exhibition took place, uh, rooms from the home, as it were. So uh, the, the art institution, the museum was being treated as a home. Uh, life and the family was being treated as a kind of um, a cipher for the Academy. And this overlapping of art and life uh, was at the fore with these totem-like um, sculptures created by Patrick with his family members um, making the claim that a family should claim over uh, that family life should claim over the institution of art. So this was the concept and uh, it was expressed through sculptures and through these signs. So uh, the, the, the art as it were explains itself to you, it speaks very directly to you, it adopts this tone of a parent telling a story to his or her child um, and uh, it also um, that storytelling dimension uh, also was at the center of this book that was produced called The Secret to a Good Life, Bob and Roberta Smith, which you can see on your screen. Uh, that was then published by the Royal Academy alongside the exhibition. And um, in the next part of the presentation, which I don't think we're going to run very much of because there's a real echo with videos. But Patrick, uh, when he became aware that there was going to be this clash between today and the opening of his major exhibition um, and commission, uh, for um, uh, P the Peabody Trust called the Thamesmead Codex. It's a very big exhibition and event opening tonight. Um, he said, well, what I'll do is I'll make an Instagram uh, live film, uh, which he does regularly as part of his art. He uses social media in this way to, to communicate very broadly. Um, and you can see on the screen, uh, he says, Bob and Roberta Smith, The Secret to a Good Life, Get a 3B Pencil, a short film for at London Met Uni. So this was on um, Saturday, it was made, uh, and we recorded it. And now Bo is going to try to play some of it back to you. But just to say, we won't watch very much of it. Um, however, what is important about it is he spent the, the uh, IGTV live broadcast reading this book. So telling the story of the exhibition and of his relationship to art through his family and home life. Bo, over to you again. Because a lot of those artworks are currently on show at the Harris Museum and because I'm uh, hoping to take part, albeit remotely, in uh, London, Metropolitan's, um, London Metropolitan University's Home and Making Interdisciplinary uh, Research Forum. So if you're <laughs> watching, uh, 
on next Thursday uh, evening. And so I can't really do it because I'm intensely in another great architectural sort of site. But I'm here at the Royal Academy and to talk about this project, the secret, oh, it's all back to front. It's <laughs> really complicated. So I'm going to read you this uh, uh, book now, the whole of the book. And it says, The Secret to a Good Life. Very keen on doing these videos, so I'll reverse the camera. You could then make text. It's a complete But anyway, forgive me uh, in advance. And I'm going to read you this text. And then show you some of the artworks. The Secret to a Good Life. Bob and Roberta Smith. Uh, Deirdre Borlace met my father, as it will, at the Royal Academy of Art in 1943, where he made this painting. So that's my memory. And this is really her story. So I've made this in large, bold letters. That's the Thanks, Bo. Thank you very much. Artwork. All right, so back to the presentation. Uh, okay, so um, that, that extract from uh, the book, uh, he was really just reading it and, and what we'll do in the, in, in, in the feed afterwards, in the, in, the, in the chat afterwards is include the links. Now, um, I just wanted to, to finish this off by saying that this um, project, The Secret to a Good Life, uh, with its aspiration to move very much between, as it were, the family and the institution, between art and life, between the home and the museum, uh, formed the basis of a practice research portfolio output that we uh, submitted recently for the REF in Unit of Assessment 32. And just to give you a sense of how uh, Patrick worked uh, in order to thematize and produce his practice within uh, and, and frame it in research and bring the research uh, dimension to the fore, I'm going to very briefly run through um, uh, an outline of what that output looked like. Um, we produced these outputs in order to capture the contribution that our practitioner researchers make uh, very much in terms of um, in, term, in terms of their practice, that is to say not attempting to retro engineer a research argument out of it, but rather communicating as faithfully as possible the thought process and the content of the research. Um, and so in each of these booklets, uh, we started just with the outline details of the project. So this, of course, was an exhibition, which is one of the practice, uh, one of the practice research uh, um, categories for the REF. Uh, it had a budget and it had a, had, a, had, a, had a place, but it very much told the story of the work installed in the gallery uh, on its own terms and how also part of that research involved performance. Um, we took the form of the REF um, uh, additional information descriptions to form a kind of a statement, and this is how that statement looked. Um, and then in each case, uh, pr provided an introduction to the work, giving it a context, talking about the rigor and method very much in terms of how the art was made, how it drew upon a context in the art world, and of course also in, in, the, in the critical world. And this is that sculpture that Bob was talking about, his, his mother, and then in terms of the insights that were gathered uh, through the research or which became manifest in the exhibition itself, um, these in the case of Patrick's um, uh, output, The Secret to a Good Life, were summarized in four kind of discussion points. One, to do with gender in the institution. Second, family and the concept of art as life, which is very much where this kind of domestic setting provides, if you'd like, the springboard for the artwork. Third, biography and history as a kind of sociological principle by means of which Patrick's mode of practice is made manifest. Um, and, uh, and fourth, oh, I've lost track of the fourth one, but there you go. And then at the end of it, we included this uh, material about the, the dissemination of uh, the output. Um, in regard to today's themes, uh, we have a couple of questions, a few questions here that Patrick um, posed really through uh, his, his work. How has the idea of the home or home life played a role in grounding his critique of institutions such as the Royal Academy? If we find common ground in the idea of the home, what can we imagine a home to be? Can it help us to realize our creative aspirations? And for him, one of the messages was that his emergence into art was a family 
situation. And what does Bob and Roberta Smith's family story tell us about how our personal biographies can fit into a shared or everyman narrative about belonging together or being at home? Thank you very much uh, on behalf of Patrick. And that's the end of that one. Okay, now I just have to unshare it. Thank you very much, Matthew. I, I can do that. Um, thank you very much. Um, so next up, we have um, a joint presentation from Nitin Butler and, and Samedha Garth. And um, Nitin is an urban researcher and artist and an educator based at ETH Zurich, uh, where he's also currently pursuing his doctoral studies on a Swiss excellent fellowship. Um, Samedha is an artist and designer um, and also an educator. She's a, an associate professor at the School of Communication Design, UID, in Ahmedabad in India. So over to you. Um, I will share the presentation for you and you can um, control the slides. Thanks. Thanks, Bo. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and thanks for allowing us to um, bring our work into conversation with, um, with, uh, with all the excellent uh, presenters uh, in, in, in the panel. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe uh, take a few minutes to um, set the stage for Sumedha, who actually is the artist on this project. And uh, I'm rather kind of a collaborator. I'm, I'm an academic and um, we sort of um, collaborated together. And it's, it's sort of uh, me learning about art from Sumedha rather than sort of producing art myself um, and um, yeah so it's uh, it, the the project sort of um, was born out of um, my doctoral um, research in in Delhi where I'm sort of tracing um, the planetary entanglements of uh, sort of like transformations in in Delhi's hinterland so sort of like this agrarian territory becoming really really rapidly urban and um, what I realized while uh, doing my field work uh, quite soon is that there are other types of worlding, as uh, Ananya Rai calls it, um, which um, are also sort of embedded within these uh, larger processes that we see. And one of them is um, fast fashion, um, kind of uh, what we wear and how it's sort of like transforming the whole planet. Uh, in a way, and uh, uh, very, very um, sort of um, uh, small places like, uh, you know, one of these uh, sort of villages that uh, became uh, transformed into a tenement settlement. Um, it was sort of like uh, uh, welded um, into this um, planetary uh, fast fashion, uh, uh, let's say, um, kind of um, uh, global value chain, if you can call it. Um, so um, I, I, I just sort of put the cover of these two books together. Uh, the, the one on the left, it's called Empire of Cotton, and uh, it's by Sven Beckett, and he talks about uh, the large history of cotton and how um, places like Manchester transformed um, through sort of uh, getting early technologies uh, from India to, to England and through colonization and how it sort of plays into neo-imperialism. So how cotton is um, the driving uh, force behind uh, capitalism and globalization. And the other book um, on the right hand side uh, by, um, uh, by Gillian Hart, it's about South Africa's sort of post-apartheid transformation. And uh, what um, these two books uh, sort of made me um, do is to pay attention to other forms of worlding. Uh, to uh, think about how to denaturalize dispossession. So kind of um, not assume um, uh, kind of a linear trajectory of um, modernization or um, kind of uh, evolution of places, but rather to see them through um, uh, sort of like space time, which is uh, planetary in nature, but also cyclical. And uh, thirdly, and I think that was most important to overcome a crisis of representation. So to not um, kind of uh, re rehash um, some of these uh, cartographic tools that we are so used to using and which sort of um, carry a lot of colonial um, uh, metaphors. So in a way, sort of how to decolonize as well, like uh, representation. Um, 
so just um, to show where this place is so the place there's this sort of settlement uh, that we Sumedha and I worked in um, it's called Kapasira and it's um, sort of very close to um, a very very big uh, industrial settlement which is um, one of the biggest uh, garment manufacturing centers in India and they they manufacture for brands like um, Zara American Apparel um, all 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 of these sort of like big uh, fast fashion uh, brands um, and uh, uh, the people who live in these settlements are actually um, um, sort of cyclical migrants who uh, spend um, nine months uh, working in these industries um, and they're sort of in some sort of casual contracts and they have to return to uh, do farming for a part of the year uh, from the villages that they come from. Um, so the sort of um, houses or the idea of home here is is kind of uh, quite um, interesting because um, the tenements look like this. So it's, it's kind of reminiscent of um, 19th century Manchester in a way. Um, very, very tightly packed um, sort of um, housing units, like kind of a shoebox kind of model of housing people. Um, so like a nine square meter space for a family of three or four. Uh, and uh, it's sort of, um, it's a place which is always in transit. It's it's linked with um, uh, places that uh, the migrants call home or um, where they sort of are in a permanent uh, cyclical relationship with. Um, so um, the idea then, um, sorry, um, the idea then, uh, so there's this kind of a video, uh, which Bo, if you want to play at the background, um, or perhaps we could do it later if, if, if there's time. Um, but uh, probably to talk about these two book covers then. Um, so I, I while, while I was researching, um, the one of the books that sort of really inspired me was this sort of uh, a different kind of ethnography. Um, and it's about how to um, understand um, everyday life through uh, sensory and um, creative perspectives. And uh, while I was reading this book, serendipitously, um, uh, Koj, uh, which is a socially engaged art uh, um, collective in, in Delhi, they announced um, a sort of call for projects. And uh, uh, Sumedha, incidentally, was sort of um, available at that time. She she was on a sort of sabbatical for a year. And we decided to, I, I sort of approached Sumedha, should, should, would you like to work on a project um, and um, maybe think about how um, we can do a socially engaged art project around the idea of home and um, dwelling. Um, and that's that's how sort of this project started. And, and the, the book on the left is, um, also a very interesting one um, by Claire Bishop on artificial health, it's called. And the idea that she sort of talks about there is that um, right now there's a lot of um, conversation around uh, socially engaged art, but uh, in in fact, it's, it's just a return of the social in art. And it's uh, sort of always been uh, art, um, uh, so the social has always been driving um, art uh, production. So I'll sort of like transition into letting Sumedha probably talk about uh, the project more. Thank you, Nitin. Um, thank you for setting the context. Um, I'm going to just move forward. Not being okay. Oh, but the text is warped. Okay. Um, the text was actually it's fine. So, um, but I wanted to, but we were exploring through this project, and we also call our practice studio other worlds. Is is this idea of an inner world and an outer world, and then there being other worlds. And the idea of home, to me, has always been this idea of home within us, 
which is um, imaginary or a memory or a dream or a, or something that we carry. And then the outer world or the outer home, which is in today's time, the built environment or the homes that we make and inhabit and live in. Um, and to me, it's, it's, we're always negotiating this inner outer through the spaces that we make as home. And so this entire project was really about that, was really about um, these migrant women who live in Capacera um, that go back home two, three times a year. And what, what is home to them and how do they perceive this, this space that they live in where they work, where they're migrant laborers living in a tenement town, and then this home that they go to, go back to twice a year. And, and this is really their journey and their story. Um, they are the artists, in fact. Um, I feel that in this project, our role was more as a facilitator um, than an artist. And, um, and you can see them. There are six women that are walking. And this is, this is their story. All the little pieces that we see are their inner worlds their memories, um, their dreams, and um, and I'm going to move forward. So, what are the imaginaries of home? The text on this um, on the slides have changed a little bit, so I'm just going to speak through them. Um, what happened, in essence, uh, very short in this project was when we started working in the tenement town in Capacera. Um, we found it was a very, very, very gendered space. And there were literally, there were no safe spaces for women, for children. And, and the idea of art is different culturally, contextually, and everyone understands art differently. Um, so what we really wanted to do was, was to appropriate one of these factory spaces and turn it into a safe space, turn it into a, into a, home space in a way where women could gather, children could gather and they could stitch, they could stitch their stories like stitching circles, you know, from back in the day from indigenous knowledge systems. Um, so this actually, this piece has been stitched by Manju, she's from Bihar. And this is her representation of the actual tenement town. So you can see the construction, how the walls have been raised. Um, and this is her understanding or her imagination or interpretation or experience of that Edmund town. And, and I thought for me or for us, the big question is what is home? Like, is home an imagination? Is home a memory of home from your childhood? And or is home a dream that you have of a place you want to be? Or is it a feeling? And, and I think through all these pieces, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Second. Um, okay. What is it? What does it really mean to belong? So over the last couple of over a few months, um, we took the cadastral map of Capacera and handed it over to the women and said, Okay, now why don't you reimagine this cartography or reimagine re this space? Um, what are your inner worlds, the outer worlds? So we were workshopping things like a memory or a dream. And this is Mamta, she's also from Bihar, and this is a memory of her with her sister in the fields in her village where they grow corn. And uh, this is in the cornfields. It's her memory of going to the cornfields and eating corn when the, the harvest is just ripe. And, and to me, what was really interesting is the connection, uh, our connection to land, our connection to the earth, our connection to each other. And what does it really mean to belong? Because there's also an entire community from the same village now living in the tenement town as another community. So how do they carry home with them? 
And for me, it's through the myth making, it's through the ritualization, it's through the objects, um, you know, referring back to what Patrick showed, the, the totem, um, the, the family totem pole. So it's, it's also the objects. So this, I'm just showing you certain pieces that kind of, um, sorry about that, that it's that sort of show their the women's idea of home and and place making and belonging and identity, because as a migrant woman in Capaceda, you have a very different identity to to when you go back home. So who are you really, and who do you belong to, and who are you when you are home? Like I I feel that too when I move different places and. It's really this hybridization of identity. So Bandana here has drawn this piece and she's she was the youngest of the group of the stitching circle. Um, she's drawn herself having returned home back from the city, from the urban um, city of Delhi. She's gone back to her village. And on the right, you can see she's she's standing there with she's filling water. And on the left is her mother, you know, grinding spices. And she's kind of showing that dichotomy because she's at home, but she's wearing a, a dress or the fashion is of the city. And the house behind her is is like differently constructed. OK. And and the house behind her mother is, is a village settlement. So the idea of what we've been exploring through this project is people, places and stories. So where and how do people relate to spaces and how do they develop stories, communes, tribes? And home really is an interface between that inner and outer, uh, between people, places and stories and the imaginations of home that we carry. Um, and I'm going to just quickly talk about this, which is this idea of making sanctuary, um, a place where we feel safe, a womb space, a space of rest. And, and what we tried to do through this project was to create or uh, co-create a safe space for these women to stitch their stories of abuse, of violence, of, of gender disparities, of migration, of alcoholism of various things that that happened through the stitching and this is um, a workshop where we invited the city in to the safe space to stitch with the women and um, I just want to end with talking about this idea of home and home that moves that we carry with us in our memories as migrants um, which we all are in essence, and um, and our ideas of home. So this is the final piece that they made. This is their planetary map of fast fashion or their counter cartography. And the, the middle piece is actually their inner world. Those are their stories. Um, those are their dreams, their aspirations, their observations. And on the left is actually the grid or the plan of Capaceda, which incidentally means the village of cotton. Um, and on the right is, is all this fast fashion and all these things that we're spewing into our oceans. And the women sort of are walking this, this bridge, this journey between. And so it was actually a piece that that developed, that was co-created over time. None of us knew what it would look like at the end. Uh, but now that we see it through this idea of this inner world and outer world and a larger planetary worlding and a personal worlding, it it's just um, makes more sense. So yeah, and I just want to leave everyone with one question which is um, something that is coming up for me, um, which is that what or where is home when your perception or imagination or idea of home is otherworldly? So how do you interface that 
in in this outdoor built Thank environment. You. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> Nathan, do you want to add anything? Okay. I just Thank want to whole thing that uh, it is um, so the the whole sort of cartography or the whole uh, the, the the material of this um, uh, project was uh, actually uh, fabric waste from fast fashion production. So almost 40% of all fabric is wasted and the women sort of, uh, when they cannot find work, they sort of collect it and uh, use this material and imbibe it with care to produce uh, things that um, they can use in their households and other things. So that was kind of the materiality of, of the project itself. So yeah, that's the last thing I just wanted to add. Great, thank you both for your presentation. Um, we'll move swiftly on. I, I see that there's a question posted um, in the chat, but we'll, we'll save all the questions to the end. So um, next up, we have um, Sandra Denise Polter, who um, is an architect and a national uh, teaching fellow. Uh, Sandra is also our uh, deputy head of architecture um, here at London Met. Um, so over to you, Sandra, to, uh, for your presentation. Thanks, Paul. Are you gonna gonna put it up? Sure, sure. That's great. And then I just need to press. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Okay. So I'm Sandra, and um, I will present our work of crossing cultures. So since 2016, the work of crossing cultures explores how architecture students' learning can be enhanced through the involvement of stakeholders and communities and how at the same time we can positively feed back into these communities. Um, the work is engaged in a small and depopulated village called Belmonte in a rural area in South Italy, where our students have become part of the community they're helping to build. Some even have made home, which has contributed to the reactivation of Belmonte. And at this point, I would like to mention my colleague and teaching partner, Jay McAllister, and um, our graduate, Rita Adamo, who is now a PhD student, and she's co-founder of the NGO Lesepia, based in Calabria. Um, and she's really instrumental for the project and also contributing to the research, which I'm showing today. Um, so this presentation will first outline the university context and curriculum design, secondly, the backgrounds of the people who join the workshops in Italy, which might be key to the success of creating a new community and integrating newcomers. And thirdly, the activities happening in Belmonte, which are a method to create a common ground and feeling at home. And for the relationship, the participants established with the place. So, as I said, this is a university based research initiative where students play a key role. Um, here, the students do not act as professional service providers, but they are in a unique position to move between citizen and professional. Crossing Cultures, that's the project on the right bottom image, is part of London Met's um, Center for Urban and Built Ecologies called CUBE, and one of a series of projects we have done, taking students out of the design studio to experience and apply themselves in the real world. Usually, we work in one location for several years with changing student cohorts. And the aim always is to achieve positive change over time. So the site um, for Crossing Cultures is this picturesque village called Belmonte Calabro in one of the poorest areas in Italy. And only circa 50 people live in the old town now, um, as the young move away to find work in larger cities. But at the same time, Italy's southern coast has seen very large numbers of asylum seekers arriving, which you see on the top right image. Um, crossing cultures really is about integrating newcomers into an existing population and how by attracting and integrating those newcomers, the local population can regrow and potentially help reactivate the whole area. In the past years, you have probably all read 
that refugees have been, as quoted here, the salvation for some depopulated Italian towns. For example, for Riace, which is a town close to Belmonte in Calabria. Newcomers have been welcomed in order to bring life back to these ghost towns. Crossing cultures is different to those examples because our students, by working with locals and refugees, are really instrumental in achieving the integration and the feeling of home of newcomers. At the same time, we discovered that they also became part of the new community and made home for themselves. So the work um, our students have produced with locals and asylum seekers in Belmonte over the last five years ranges from small scale constructions, for example, used for community dinners, to organizing events and the renovation of a community building, which you see on the top right. This continuity of engagement in Belmonte since 2016 has been possible through curriculum design. Um, we have paired the studio activities in London, that's uh, the yellow line in the middle, with the field experience, the live engagement in Belmonte, that's the top green line. In this way, we built a growing body of work over the years. We call this a method of layering, and this method of layering consecutive temporary interventions and events in one location and continuing the work every time we go to Belmonte has enabled the integration of newcomers, and for some, Belmonte has become a new home. The COVID-19 pandemic has scaled up this work and offered a group of our students to move to Belmonte for the whole of semester one which is framed um, in orange. I will talk more about this new experience, Studio South, um, and of the students finding temporary home in Italy at the end of my presentation. The activities initiated through this project can teach our students important skills beyond the subject of architecture. I think that's quite important. We have observed that they can foster group cohesion and that students can experience the importance of moral action. I want to now introduce the complexity of backgrounds of the people who participate in this work, as I feel um, these are key to the success of helping the integration of newcomers and creating this new community. Looking at the three different groups, so we have asylum seekers, uh, locals and students. The first group, the asylum seekers, comes mostly from Africa, and I've put an indicative list of countries on the slide. The second group, um, so the people who live in Belmonte, they are Italians, but interestingly, in conversations with the elder generation, we have learned that a lot of them have lived abroad to earn a living and experience migration themselves, and they only returned back to Belmonte for retirement. Our students from London Met obviously come from London to Calabria, but um, on second sight, a majority has been home elsewhere before moving to London. And if they grew up in London, then often their parents had migrated to the UK from another country. And many of our students speak a second language at home. And these are quotes from two of our graduates. And we feel they're exemplary of the students' backgrounds and explain how they felt close to the asylum seekers they met in Belmonte with a particular curiosity of wanting to understand what home is. So I'll let you read this. I'm not going to read it out for you. I have more, more to come, more quotes. Um, I already showed this slide earlier and would now like to talk more about what we do in Belmonte and that this has become a method of establishing a common ground between all participants, which also suggests that it makes the participants feel at home. Um, he, an asylum seeker, defines his experience and how the working method has um, positively impacted on him. We heard the term common ground a lot, which seems to have created, uh, been created by the hands-on building workshops, where different people with different backgrounds collaborated and shared different skills. Oops. Somehow not moving the next slide. Yep, perfect, maybe it's a big one. 
So the overall work produced over a year consists of small scale structures like the one on the left, where the design is defined through the creative process of making. So everyone is involved in the outcome and the design through the hands-on making, really. Important part of the overall work are also larger scale and paper-based visions, which you see on the right, developed by students back in the London studio. So this paper-based work, which feeds into the vision of a more lively future for the village, is brought back to Belmont and presented to the local community in an exhibition every year. Here, a film screening night, which the students organized in the medieval village as a backdrop. The interest of the students from London in their small town in a rather deprived area of Italy has certainly made the locals look at their village in a different way and revalue it, as the vice mayor states on this slide as well. So for the locals, the returning groups of young people not only temporarily reactivate the village, but importantly, their continuous interest has made the locals revalue their home. It is useful to look at the relationship, the three different groups, the locals, the students and the asylum seekers developed in Belmonte and with the place and how this contributed to feeling at home. So in 2019, we had conducted a series of interviews as a collaboration between architecture and colleagues at Warwick and City University. Um, and so from the perspective of a local, the workshop provided an opportunity for the participants of spending time together. The workshops creating the experience of living together and being part of a big community. And both um, the students and asylum seekers expressed the desire of making home, as explained here by one of our students. Asylum seekers become willing to create a home and they find a community that accepts them. And most importantly, a place that has potential and offers possibilities to them. Um, the experience of collaborating and working jointly was positively identified in particularly by asylum seekers. And it was seen as an opportunity of getting closer and sharing their stories and experiences with the students and locals. And part of the 2019 summer workshop was a graphics workshop, which also brought interesting findings about the theme of home and memory and maybe links a little bit to the previous presentation. This fanzine page produced in the workshop demonstrates that we feel home with what we recognize. I've ex extracted the drawing here um, from one of the participating asylum seekers. This Belmonte, so on the image, Belmonte, it says it underneath, is on the left. And the memory of the asylum seeker, um, which that view in Belmonte brought up from his home in Senegal is on the right. So he merged that into one drawing. It is probably useful to bring in Edwin Heathcote's quote here, home is a site of memory and meaning. Similarly, a student who joined us from Canada reflected on positive memory created through the workshop. Oh, I think we've lost Sandra for a second there. Uh, let's see if she can rejoin us. Hi, Sandra. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. So maybe I, I talk about this slide again. I, I, did you hear what I said about the um, image of the asylum seeker? You're sort of in the middle of it, I think. Okay. So Belmonte, Senegal on the left is um, Belmonte and the asylum seeker by remembering what, oh, actually it, it brought up memories of his home in Senegal and brought that together. And um, I felt that um, home is a site of memory and meaning by Edwin Heathcote is quite um, uh, positive here to bring to the discussion. Um, and then on the right, we have a quote from a student who joined us from Canada, 
who reflected on positive memory created through the workshop and its effect of wanting to come back. Okay, so since 2019, the renovation of a permanent place in the old village called the Casa has initiated a new possibility and scaled up the previous activities and also of creating home. The new community created the word Belmondo from Belmonte, beautiful world, which Domus called an open and inclusive imagination where anyone can potentially become a local, so probably become a local and maybe find home. Um, students perceived that the renovation work on the Casa, they were creating a space for people to regularly visit during the year, with the potential of literally making a home and a place that can grow. Um, then we had lockdown and students experienced isolation at home and online teaching. And as a consequence of this was that 10 of our students took the initiative and moved to Belmonte for semester one in 2020, with the cost of living in London unaffordable for students who had lost jobs during the pandemic and the university promising online teaching as an option, our students found temporary home in Belmonte and set up Studio South which I like to compare to an artist residency. Even when the lockdown hit Calabria, they shared working together in the Casa as their studio space. And I was told by students that um, the locals also came over to watch football games with them. Um, yeah, and they temporarily found home in Belmonte. And they shared tutorials together while calling the tutors online into the Casa on the left image is a tutorial and on the right you see them connecting to the studio and the students in London in Aldgate. So while students were reactivating the public spaces in Belmonte, they contributed to a cultural exchange with the locals by living there. And the statement of a local is quite touching, I feel. And this is the last slide with a collection of comments from our Studio South students who we met on Monday to hear their experience looking back on temporarily making home in Belmonte and also to hear their view on developing a residency study model also in other locations in the future. So um, that's something Jane and I, I are really looking into at the moment. Um, so yeah, is it maybe a possibility of making a formal offer of something like Studio South, so a student residency somewhere where students make temporary home. Um, yeah. Questions probably later, I assume. I'm done. Thank you very much, Sandra. Yeah, we'll have the questions at the end, but do, do feel free to um, post any comments. I'll pick them up at the end. Um, OK, so we have next um, with us um, Nasia Asul Vermeeren. Um, who is a research and teaching fellow at the Bartlett Development, Development, sorry, Development Planning Unit, uh, the DPU at uh, University College London. Um, let me just share with you all her slide. And um, over to you, Ignacia. Thank you, Bo. Thank you for the invitation to present today. Um, I'm going to be presenting um, the work that I did for my PhD. So this is, um, and the, the field work for this project was done before COVID, but I've been in touch with the community and at the end I will be presenting something short that we've also done in 2020. So um, my PhD thesis was called The Politics of Homemaking and it's based in the city of Viña del Mar in Valparaíso in Chile. So Chile, country in South America, and I, I started researching this place because I had lived there before and I was working in an NGO that was delivering housing, so housing from um, the government, uh, from the Ministry of Housing um, in this area. Uh, so I, was, I knew quite well this, this area. And what was very important about this place was that one third of the country's informal settlements uh, are located in, in this region and 
what you can see here is that actually this is a, a very touristy um, city. It's not the capital. Um, it's where most of the tourism from other parts of Latin America, people come here. And it's an incredibly unequal city. So you would have all this kind of high rises. Uh, there are all second homes. And in the um, hills in the back is where all the informal settlements are. So I was very interested in understanding uh, the inequality of this place and why is it that there is so many informal settlements in this place. And also while I was working um, in this place before as a practitioner, what I found incredibly interesting was that people were saying that they didn't want to go to social housing. Informal dwellers were actually rejecting um, the Chilean housing policy. The Chilean housing policy is um, incredibly well known in Latin America and in the world. It has been used, uh, replicated in many countries in Latin America and also in South Africa. Um, it's based on a whole housing system. So it's um, informal dwellers can apply to the subsidy and um, they can apply individually or collectively. And uh, this housing is built, it's a new housing that is built in an area, usually in the periphery of the cities, because that's where the land is cheaper. And it has produced um, examples like this one in this picture that is now incredibly well known and actually they're all going to knock down all this housing because it's, it has created at the end kind of, um, ghettos of poverty in which um, everyone um, is creating very, very big areas of only social housing. So I think that this quote here, uh, Rodriguez kind of sums up um, what the housing policy has been about. So it says traditionally the housing problem has been conceptualized a shortage of housing provision. Thus a large part of, this, of the solutions understood as moving families from slums to social housing. And while living in Viña del Mar, um, people were saying we don't want to go to social housing because we think that this will be in detriment to our well-being, our mental health, and we don't want to we don't want our children to grow in social housing. And what's interesting about that is that the, the housing policy in, in Chile, um, it's, it's not based on, on a rental scheme the way that it's here, it's, it's um, home ownership. So people are, with a very, very small um, kind of fee, they can pay 200 pounds to get this house that it's a, it's a, it's a big asset, it's, the, it's the, one of the biggest asset in, transfers of money that the government does to an individual in the country. So in that way, uh, it was interesting to hear that people are rejecting this big asset. So I wanted to understand why, why was this and what was the alternative? And then at the end, what does it mean to create a home if it's um, not in the, in the way that the Chilean housing policy is proposing? So that's where I came to the concept of home. And I think I started with the, with the concept that Alison Blunt, she's a geographer here um, in the UK, in Queen Mary. And I, her way of defining home really resonated with what I wanted to understand about, about the housing policy in the country. So she says that this term refers to home as a contested site, shape a different axis of power and over a range of scales, mobilizing identity beyond an individual sense of self and geography of a home within, but also beyond the household, a focus on their collective and political inscription over space and time and on their contested embodiment by women. So this definition for me did a lot of things that I was trying to understand. So one is how first the idea of scales, so that home is not just a domestic space, but it's the neighborhood and the city. And this was very clear with the demand of dwellers in which they were like, we don't just want the housing units, but we want to remain in the city. And we know if they we go on social housing, we'll probably have to move out of the city. It was also, it defines the home as a contested site. And I think that both as dwellers and women that I ended up focusing on, on women and on a gender perspective on housing, this made a lot of sense because of the, of the violence and about the inequality that exists in this context. And also to understand it in different over space and time. So this allowed me to think about it in many, in many different ways and in a much more richer way than just the definition of housing. Um, but I also wanted to look at what people were actually doing on the ground and what were they so i wanted to not just focus on the idea of home but on the practices 
of how do you create home and how are people creating home. So I, I've kind of defined this idea of homemaking practices and also of uh, homemaking and home and making practices um, as the everyday activities carried out by residents which construct, maintain and plan a home while generating a symbolic sense of home um, in and from the settlement. And home and making practices, on the other hand, are those like everyday micro events that destroy or undermine the creation of home. So with that definition that kind of emerged from the field work, it was, it was a relationship between the theory and the fieldwork, I ended up um, with, and through the, the fieldwork that I'm going to be telling you now, I ended up clustering the practices in three dimensions. So practices around the construction of the home. So how is the home built in the informal settlement? And what is that telling us? About uh, what people want and the idea of home they have, about the maintenance of the home and about the planning of the home. And here, through a series of participatory workshops with participants, with I work with um, 100 participants uh, in two informal settlements, uh, we ended up with this list of six main practices in which they define them as the most important ones and also the ones that took them the most time in their daily lives. So the first one was progressive construction towards a permanent housing. So this kind of building the housing in the everyday sense. Then the creation of safer spaces, and this is something that women did, and I'm going to be focusing on that. Um, then how do you do housework in a context in which there's no accessible water, uh, electricity, and the difficulties that uh, doing housework on a day-to-day on a -day, uh, without services? Then care work in solidarity, so child care and how does the networks um, between the community I'm going to also be focusing on that one. And then uh, finally, in terms of planning of the home, it means people want to stay uh, in the settlement and they've been um, negotiating with authorities so that they can, they are able to buy the plot of land and they are able to plan the, the space where they are. So the other two um, practices were planning by dwellers and also female organization. Most of this community, 80%, um, the um, the community leaders are women. So uh, for time, I'm just going to focus on the two practices that are, I think the, the most key kind of gender practices and the ones that I found the most interesting ones. So uh, one is the creation of safer spaces and the other one is uh, childcare in solidarity. So the activities um, that I was doing with participants were participatory photography. And in that we did two types. So one was about, um, taking pictures about what does home mean to you um, and other things. And then we also did photo diaries in which they would take pictures of their day to start identifying what are those practices in the everyday. So this is uh, then once we had, for example, this is uh, photo diaries and then we will look at them in terms of the types of practices, the times that happen, etc. For women it was incredibly revealing uh, the, the amount of things they did when they started seeing these photo diaries. I also did uh, live stories uh, with 50 people um, and the, the question there was tell me how you arrived to this house. So people would tell the story of how they, they moved there and what the decisions that they had made. And, um, and also we worked in that same live story, we were also doing timelines. So they were um, writing down and also doing diagrams of how their house had changed in that time. And this is, for example, this is someone that I interviewed and she had only arrived uh, three days ago. Uh, she had arrived from Colombia uh, looking for better work opportunities and she had ended up in the settlement and this was her house. So just to focus on the two practices, so childcare in solidarity, it's a practice that, that um, emerged Every woman that I was interviewing, they were always saying that they were leaving their children to someone else in order to be able to do something. And they were saying that it was incredibly important that the, the, um, the relationships that they have in the settlement in order to be able to raise children um, as a collective endeavor. And they were saying that although they do have a nursery that is close to a settlement, that didn't allow them the flexibility that um, doing it between themselves 
gave them because of the time difference, because of the multiple care responsibilities that they have. So um, the, the key characteristics of this was that it was informal and it was flexible, that it was uncommoded uncom by health, and it was based on a complex uh, solidarity network, and it also relies on social spatial relations. So we mapped a few of them. And it was very interesting to see how people were first First, 50% of the people that I interviewed uh, decided who they wanted to live around them. So they invited school friends, their families, everyone to live close to them. So they really created this kind of family units. And also the type of different types of favors that they would do to each other. So it was not only in terms of childcare, but also, for example, all the residents that would get water delivered by the municipality. If they didn't spend all the water, they would give it to a neighbor. So there's a huge, it's a complex um, solidarity network. And then in terms of creation of safe, safer space, so 40% of the, or the female participants had said that they had left their house in the settlement because of domestic violence, and they had moved to another house in the settlement. So the flexibility that living in the settlement allows them for um, creating new safer spaces and although this is an individual strategy so it's one woman deciding to leave her house is supported by other family members and other members of the community that help them build that new house so this is uh, this is from uh, a participant took this picture um, and she took the picture of her house because she felt incredibly proud of have built this house on her own and then Finally, this is part, so this, all the other, um, all the other things were done during uh, 2015 and I've kept um, in contact with, with the groups I'm working with and last year I was working in a project with the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Chile and we, we organised a call for International Day for the End of um, Gender Violence, in which um, there was this uh, collective embroidery tapestry that was created by women across the country, in which they embroider a word that um, they wanted to hear more in relation to gender violence. And um, there was a group of women from the settlement that organized themselves to embroider as well and to participate in this call. And this is one of the participants, she's Pilar, and she, she wrote empathy because she said that they really needed to start being more empathetic about, they know that there is a lot of gender violence in the settlement, but it's very difficult to sometimes reach out and support other women. And I've really seen a, a huge um, change actually in women from five years to now in terms of conscientization of gender violence. Um, and finally, I think what's, what this uh, research has um, helped me see in terms of reframing home, the notion of home in the lines of women's practices, and is, is that homemaking takes place in a violent and unequal urban and gender context so really challenging the idea of home as this safe haven that usually is used and this comes very much from uh, feminist geographers that have said we need to quite we need to think about home not just as a safe space um, then the spatial aspect of homemaking is fundamental for a critical notion of home and the everyday life of women in the settlement so home not just as this abstract idea but actually how it manifests in space um, thirdly, homemaking is not necessarily a continual and linear process because this is something that t tends to happen in um, informal housing that many academics say that people kind of build as, as they have more resources and as they have more time, they're able to build a better house. But actually what my research was showing is that because of gender violence, because of um, environmental causes, homemaking is constantly uh, happening because it's not just conquered once but it's actually something that is constantly on, on the making and finally that homemaking practice can create a space for solidarity and agency and um and i kind of propose that homemaking practices should be an area that we should be exploring more uh, for understanding the potential for transformative change in terms of gender relations in housing thank you Thank you very much, Ignacia. Um, 
so we come to our final presentation, um, which is from Dr. Matthew Barrett. Um, and Matthew is a reader at a reader in architecture at the at London Metropolitan University um, and an architect. Uh, so over over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Bo. Okay. Um, right. So. Uh, just a bit of context. Um, I am an architect uh, and a researcher. Uh, I'm a member of the Centre for Urban and Built Ecologies at London Met, uh, same research centre as Sandra and Bo. Um, and a key strand of my research concerns spatial interpretation and urbanisation in the global south. Much of this work looks at the overlapping of formal and informal urban orders and at questions of interpretation with regard to city life. The study that I'm presenting today is linked to humanitarian and development discourses with an emphasis on the topic of post-disaster reconstruction. The challenge for reconstruction following a disaster, whether an earthquake, a war, climate change induced drought, whatever it may be, <clears throat> is not restricted to practical tasks, but also concerns the problem's analytical dimension. This dimension is about the reflective task of taking stock so as to learn lessons from our experiences in the humanitarian and development sector. There has been plenty of scholarly attention given to how homes may be rebuilt after disaster, whether built by donors or agencies or by the homeowners themselves. But the actual implications of the meaning of reconstruction as both human experience and <clears throat> as a phenomenon with social facets are typically deferred. These implications are inevitably considered a luxury, one that can be ill afforded at times of need. And yet without proper consideration of the meaning of reconstruction, we will surely fail in our efforts to face up to the cultural implications and questions embedded in the topic. So my presentation suggests that framing the challenge of reconstruction in relation to the full depth of the problems and challenges it presents can be useful. By depth, I mean that I am seeing reconstruction not only according to practical, but also symbolic challenges. These are therefore problems for interpretation. This may sound somewhat theoretical given the practical obstacles that reconstruction must inevitably address. And yet when we visit the concrete, <clears throat> when we visit the concrete reality of the domestic environments of those some refer to as the dispossessed, we are reminded of the tendency that we all have to bring order to our surroundings. We see in the typical home even a shack or a temporary shelter within which a bedside table or salvaged cabinet acts as a centerpiece to the room, perhaps holding family photographs, keepsakes and treasured objects. We see a world realized by means of spatial practices. My suggestion is that our design capabilities as architects, built environment professionals or researchers are not as finely tuned as they should be. If we are to optimize the capacity of all those involved in the co-production of a richer, safer, more meaningful environment, uh, and we are now all familiar with the phrase build back better, we need better critical tools. So my line of reasoning here seeks to account firstly for the personal household spaces that people make. And this is really just a map of my presentation. So the, firstly, the personal household spaces, and then I will go on to rehearse an argument for the relevance of placemaking. That's the second uh, part in the context of reconstruction, according to the fundamental problem of meaningfulness. The second part of the discussion will offer a synopsis of the mode of interpretive method that underpins my work in this field. And finally, I will reflect on the concept of ownership at the heart of this debate. This aspect of the debate is concerned with the notion of owning the reconstruction process. I want to refer in this final section to the phrase owning is a verb um, in order to consciously trigger recognition of the powerful formulation that many will be familiar with coined by, coined by John Turner almost 50 years ago when he argued that housing should be considered not as an object, uh, that is not as a noun, but as a process involving things that people do. People do. And his well-known phrase is, of course, housing as a verb. This is a photograph taken by Ronnie Leverton of a South African chanty town interior in the 1990s. If I were to describe the space depicted in this photo, I might use the word design. The design of the room, if we can call it a room, has been implemented by one of its inhabitants quite possibly by the young woman who we see here in the photograph, 
Um, many who've seen this photograph have had very positive things to say. Instead of saying what an awful scene of poverty, they say it's glorious, how vivacious and bold the colors are, and more than anything else, people use the word poignant. This interior poignantly illustrates how a, living, a household living in what might be described an absence of architecture and under conditions that we might refer to as informal or disorderly has marked out and created a domestic space that is almost a diagram of orderliness. Borrowing a phrase from Jonathan Hill, I would say that this has been achieved through an architecture of occupation rather than through expert provision. So you can see how the kitchenware is neatly stacked. Uh, the wallpaper, which is made of branded soap label over, overruns, brings continuity and a sense of finish to the room. There's a roof light over the display cabinet that brings sunshine into the back of the shack over the food preparation workspace. Um, this woman, let's call her the architect for argument's sake, she stands in front of a yellow curtain that demarcates a threshold between public and private space. This orderliness reinforces the impression that what we are looking at is not a makeshift cobble or a place of abject poverty. What we are looking at is a home. It's a place that belongs to someone and to which through their belongings and practices, the owners have exerted a heartfelt claim. The way that these interior shots by Ronnie Leverton, and we'll see a couple more in a moment, depict and differentiate the inside of a city from outside is captured by contrast with an aerial photograph of a shantytown environment by David Southwood in 2004. What is perhaps notable in the contrast between the interior and exterior um, is the ordered interior well that is cared for contrasts with the uh, with the exterior which is disordered and characterized by what appears to be a lack of care. So these interior and exterior photographs document the living conditions of people who historically have been living in comparative poverty in South Africa. <clears throat> with legacy of racist governance, the South African situation documents internal displacement not due to war but through institutionalized violence summarized by the instrument of the Group Areas Act under apartheid. And you can see in this photo by Wendy Schwegman, top right hand side, um, how people were packed up into trucks as part of the Group Areas Act uh, based on the color of their skin when their land was claimed uh, because it was more desirable for use exclusively uh, for white development. Through an architectural occupation, people who had been removed would do their best to reconstruct the place of belonging that had been forcibly taken away. So under apartheid, non-white South Africans were always in transit. In this particular context, we can think of the display cabinets and interior design configurations almost as luggage. We can see them as spatial expressions of home that are made to be portable, even though the cultural program that lies at the heart of these displays is, as I will argue in a minute, a place-making program. The domestic interior quite clearly offers a sonography of aspiration and respectability for many, whether living in poverty following disaster who have had their, or who have had their hopes thwarted by circumstance. So these are people who may have very little but retain their determination to lead a dignified life. This is another one of Ronnie Leverton's images uh, of a shantytown interior and the in internal surface of the room is effectively papered here with a range of images from magazines with titles like True Love, featuring photographs of glamorous and arguably liberated black women, such as the pop singer Grace Jones. The wall can be read almost as a kind of mirror of aspirations. As such, the interior both expresses and frames the orientation that holds sway in this home. Despite the rudimentary construction of the home, the visual culture of the interior acts as an explicit manifestation of an urban imaginary located a long way away from the realities of South African township life. So, I mean, these um, tensions uh, are typical of cities the world over and particularly in the global south from unevenly wealthy Mumbai to sprawling Mexico City. This is Hong Kong, um, providing evidence of a diversity of slum environments. Uh, in Hong Kong, rooftop and high rise poverty housing is sometimes informal and sometimes simply insecure. Cities, especially <clears throat> cities, uh, dense cities such as this one, breed anonymity and isolation. And the interior schemes and configurations of objects and images comprise, one might argue, a defensive response to the atomizing and intensity of urban, urban life. Private worlds are asserted as a measure for, pres for preserving one's identity and constructing a sense of wholeness. 
One of the best known or perhaps most infamous slums in the world is Dharavi. This fame is exactly because of the complexity and conflict over claims on what has become desirable uh, Mumbai real estate, claims to not just who owns the land, but also the homes. As in Hong Kong, space is at a premium uh, and the ways in which personal objects and household identifiers are used to demarcate space have to do with reiterating a claim to dignity or a commitment to the shared territories associated with family life or collective endeavor. A final example of the effort that people invest to make a home in precarious circumstances is provided by the inhabitants of the City of the Dead in Cairo. This is a cemetery quarter that has been occupied not only by those acting as caretakers for the deceased, by, by, but by informal settlers who've made their homes in and around the tombs. Um, I visited with uh, some research colleagues in 2010. Um, a father was living in one such dwelling with his two sons, a daughter-in-law and a grandson. You can see him with his grandson. Um, as well as the home, the building accommodates a brush making workshop for the younger son. Uh, on the left here, he's the 24-year-old father of his recently born first child. The relevant aspect of what one can appreciate in such life stories and photographs is the narrative of people who have very little or who have lost most of what they had. In their efforts to exercise some control over the limited space available to them, they build what we can think of as a place of their own. This personal space calls to mind Anshuma Gokhale's memorable phrase, a tiny whole world. Following the ideas of anthropologist Daniel Miller, this world can be thought of as a cosmology in miniature. It is a speculative configuration that uses personal imaginary imagery as its frame of reference. The configuration of personal objects expresses a structure of relationships, not a one-to-one -one set of relationships, but connections between things and between self and world. As such, it is an expression of identity. It is the connectedness of these objects to one another and to personal space and the world out there that belonging becomes manifest. Belonging is brought into being as both object relations and in identifying with the self in terms of ownership. That is to say, it is not just any old world, it is my world. So uh, I'll try uh, in just five minutes or so to, to finish up, but these spatial situations, the tiny worlds and cosmological configurations speak the ways in which ordinary people express their identities and claim places through processes of occupation. My reason to share them is not simply to celebrate the creativity of those surviving adversity, but I want to reconsider the terms under which we address reconstruction. These are terms such as home and owner. And following from this to ask what we can learn about the relationships between placemaking and identity. These concerns seem rather philosophical and removed from the challenges of putting the world back together after disaster. But I'm going to uh, refer to Martin Heidegger's work in order to make a twofold point. So this quote from his essay, Building, Dwelling and Thinking, motivates his argument in regard to the housing shortage of the day. This crisis had led to mass production of what he referred to as lodgings. The buildings, the lodgings were quick to build and cheap, but little to satisfy the existential, existential need that people have for a home. And he went on to talk about this need in philosophical terms. The first part of my point concerns what Heidegger, what drove Heidegger to frame his response to the post-war housing crisis in this way. He wasn't an expert in housing, but his response to the question ended up being profound because he wasn't obliged or inclined to overlook the fundamental issues that experts naturally take for granted. And secondly, Heidegger argued that while the lodgings he called, uh, he, the lodgings had a practical sense, they did little to satisfy the existential need people have for a home. Nowhere is this need more pronounced than in communities devastated by conflict or disaster. And yet, despite acknowledging that survivors and refugees requiring a nurturing environment in which to rebuild their lives, most conventional responses to the challenge of reconstruction rank the practical aspects of the task much higher than the cultural dimensions. Okay, <clears throat> see if I can just speed up. So, uh, building back better reminds us that for reconstruction to be effective, it must be meaningful. Um, but it's hard to measure what meaning means in terms of cost and time. Uh, my comments here refer to the Building Back Better campaign, which was coined in the humanitarian sector 
uh, in the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami. Um, in it, it, it still remains controversial as a concept, uh, but in relation to the argument for philosophical reflection that underpins this presentation, what better offers is the opportunities for beneficiaries to make their own decisions. So better is always subjective. I've explored the interlocking of practical and <clears throat> uh, I've in the interlocking of practical and symbolic dimensions of dwelling in the context of owner-driven reconstruction. And I'd like to just reflect upon two key words in order to consider gaps between their meanings, home and owner. Home is, of course, a place of shelter. And I, I just noticed that I have quoted the same person that Sandra quoted earlier, uh, um, my friend Edwin Heathcote from his book, The Meaning of Home. But it is a site of memory and meanings with regard to who we are as owners. Um, it's worth considering how people go about establishing a claim upon a place and what that claim means to them. We use the word appropriate to describe the moment when people no longer keep a place or a thing at a distance, but rather they take it up. Uh, it becomes not the town, but my town, not the home, but my home. To paraphrase Daniel Miller, as objects give us comfort, places anchor us. Um, and this is my uh, penultimate slide. That the anchor that a place offers is, of course, what we do not have in conditions of transitional settlement and shelter. The need for a sense of where the ground is in such circumstances is a priority. So following John Turner's conceptualization of housing as a verb, I want to suggest that reconstruction must be considered to be a series of actions for fulfilling, uh, so go beyond being a series of actions for fulfilling certain needs. I'm not suggesting that when people are in desperate need, anything other than food, shelter, medical assistance and security should be their priorities. But if our goal is to restore communities and our aspiration to solve problems associated with the crisis, we should not pretend that these goals and aspirations can be addressed in full if we misrepresent the problems in the first place. Shelter processes understood as placemaking offer, offer, offer opportunities to build not only on practical but also symbolic dimensions of ownership. What spatial practice offers is a way of remaking the connections ripped apart by conflict or disaster. So I think I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Matthew. Okay, so that, that there are our five presentations. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um, I'd like to, um, in order to kickstart the conversation, invite uh, Dr. Beatrice de Carli, um, who is a um, senior lecturer um, in urban design um, at London Met and also the deputy director of um, the Centre for Urban and um, Ecological, uh, sorry. Um, Bill de Carli. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my words there. Um, but yes, I'd like to invite you to uh, make a few comments and maybe share your thoughts on today's presentation. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I think it would be good to um, also have a conversation before the end. I wanted to thank everyone for their presentations. It was uh, fascinating and it was fascinating to see them all together. And I thought of make, uh, I'll make one comment or possibly a set of questions for the speakers uh, that have to do again with this idea of uh, interdisciplinarity, which is something that this, these forums have been focusing on. And as I was listening to the presentations, I think it, uh, one, there are many aspects that I could be raising, but I think there's one that seems particularly important in this context is that from what you've all been discussing the experience and the idea of home and, and also the process of making home of uh, multiple facets or multiple components. So there is a, a material aspect that might be related to buildings and objects, uh, but there is definitely also a cultural aspect that uh, most of you have related to. Uh, so talking about imaginaries and, and dreams in, in Sumed and Nitin's words, or memory and meaning in what Sandra and Matthew were uh, both discussing. And as well, it seems to me that there's a very strong affective component that you've home highlighted in, in uh, for instance, this came across in Patrick's contribution and, and in this relation between the idea of home and the family, 
or in uh, Sumida, you were talking about making home as making sanctuary. And again, it, it, it seemed to relate back to this, this idea of effect. Uh, or Ignacia, when you were talking about the networks of support in, in the situations that you were observing. And then finally, as again also detailed by Ignacia, it seems that the, the home is also a, a, a political space. So it is embedded in power relations that can be violent and oppressive, as uh, actually many of you have mentioned. Uh, but there can also be relations of solidarity and sort of collective support. So observing all these different dimensions, I was wondering uh, somehow if you could all um, comment further on this interplay and how it manifests uh, in your work and in the situations that you have just described. But in particular, as, as in this forum, we have a, an interest in exploring questions of interdisciplinarity in research. I would be interested in, in maybe understanding if you find that your different disciplinary perspectives or disciplinary backgrounds have allowed you or maybe have not allowed you to, to grasp or connect to these multiple aspects. So, so by looking at, at, at this idea of home through so a, a disciplinary perspective, like what, what can we see? Can we see these this entanglements or these this different dimensions? Uh, or on the other hand, what are the limits of having a, a sort of disciplinary view uh, on the experience of home? And, and it seems to me that uh, in all of your work, there is a, uh, actually quite fluid relation between different uh, types of practice that might have to do with uh, development practice as well as arts and bringing together photography and architecture and narratives and storytelling. So somehow I'm, I'm interested in this relation between what does the, the discipline, uh, in a sense, allow us to see or, or what does it make us blind to? And, and on the other hand, how have you navigated this, uh, yeah, this, this disciplinary points of view on the home? Thanks, Beatrice. Would any of the speakers like to respond to that comment? Uh, Matthew? Uh, yeah, I can just uh, take the gap. Whoops. Lower. There we go. Um, I was just going to say that uh, thank you very much, Beatrice, uh, for getting the ball rolling. I mean, I think that one, and it's not really an answer, but just to say, I was thinking as uh, I watched some of the other uh, presentations, especially uh, when Ignacia was talking about the participatory photography and reflecting on how that maps back onto Sumeda's work with the sewing that the the methodological aspects of our work for different for, for us all is very important at navigating this relationship between the material and cultural uh, dimensions um, and in some aspect i mean this project this this session when you and i first discussed it beatrice we talked about calling it home and home making and there's a big dimension to how the making aspect is really very important not only to thinking about it critically but also how the projects have this life. I mean, I think both Sumeda and Nitin and Ignacio's project, it's a very engaged kind of research in that it's transformational. So perhaps just a, a comment to take the conversation further. Um, I wonder, Sumeda, if, as the artist in the room, um, whether you might have a response to that too. It's, it's actually really interesting. Um, it's, it's almost like different communities and different groups of people, um, they make home in different ways, but they also are making home in the same way. And, and in terms of just commenting on methodology, like this is something I actually learned in South Africa, is when the, the women, they actually sit and stitch in sacred circles. And it's, it's something that happens in, in a lot of communities across the world, including India. And, and, and it's not about making, not just making home, but also making sanctuary. And, and I feel like, to me, there is a difference, of course, but I feel in most communities where there is violence, where there is, um, I don't even know what to say, but um, um, 
where, where there have been difficult circumstances, the idea of home is very challenged because your own home can often be the place where you feel most unsafe. And then it's just about making sanctuary. But what, how do you make that? And, and is it objects? Is it tools? Is it smells? Is it people? Um, and and I, I, what I'm exploring is the relationship between people and places in that sense. How do you create community? What does that mean? And 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 what does it mean in the, what does this hybrid identity mean when you're moving from one place to the other constantly? And then where is home? Um, and I wonder if someone else wants to comment on that, um, especially um, you know the work that the students are doing in Italy in the community um, is. I'm very interested to know like what what their experiences have been in that space and um, and also you know how Patrick um, at the end showed us images of homemaking from different contexts across the globe and and I wonder if you know there is a collaborative study that we could start mapping this this outer homemaking. And connecting the inner and the outer through object, through art, through architecture. I think that's a really interesting suggestion, Sumedha. Um, mm -hmm. Sandra, do you have any thoughts um, in relation to that comment? Um, maybe not particularly to that comment, but what, what always comes up in my mind is what is actually, yeah, we ask that, what's the meaning of home? There is in Germany, you have a word which is called Heimat, and Heimat is slightly different to home. And it, that it always kind of confuses me because Heimat is not really linked to, there is to Hause and Heimat. And Heimat is, is often where you come from. Um, whereas to Hause is more, I think, like home and is much more linked to a place in terms of a building, maybe, or a room. Sorry, I mean, this is, I'm going to a tangent here, but <laughs> I think so. So and there's the question, can you actually recreate Heimat, which is so much linked to where you come from originally? Um, anyway, so that's that's one tangent to it. The other is that, that um, so we, we, we interviewed our students to a certain extent, or we had a discussion with them, and I just got after I, I sent you the presentation, I got one of the students stayed in Calabria. He is still there. The others all returned. Uh, had to do with, with um, COVID and, and returning home for Christmas and not being able to go back. One stayed. And he sent me a, a little um, um, summary of what he really thinks. Um, it, did he feel home and what made him feel home? And he said something. Um, when new people came and there are always new young people coming who now are not really our students anymore but they come from from anywhere else in italy because they hear about belmonte and this place where everybody can kind of uh become part to a certain extent he said so he really feels home because when somebody new comes he introduces them to the locals and whereas yeah. before you know so it's that thing he is really part of the community because it seems to be an insider, whereas before, you know, he had to introduce himself or, or, or that way. But now it's he's introducing the people who are really local. So would you, that, you, yeah, sorry. Would you, sorry, would you call that a sort of adopted home for him, I suppose, then um, that Belmonte has become a, a second adopted home for him? Um, I think so. I probably he might even, you know, if he was German, he might even say it became his Heimat. Um, maybe. Yeah, I think you can make Heimat and any place which, which where the memory comes in. So that's the thing. A new place where the memory comes in can become your Heimat, I think. It's really yeah. odd. <laughs> it has to do with memory is important, yeah. Of course. Um, um, and Ignatia? Yeah, just to comment a bit on what um, Lea was was asking, and I think that when when she was saying how do we 
how do we think about all these different aspects? In my case, I immediately went to thinking about methodology and that's the way that it really, all these different aspects were revealed. And something that was quite interesting when I was doing the field work is that I was doing participatory and visual um, workshops, so using photography and using embroidery, but I also did semi-structured interviews, well, they kind of open-ended interviews in which I was asking, tell me the story of how you got here and what does home mean to you? And the answers that I got from just asking, so using visual um, language-based methods to ask about home, were completely different to what I got when I use and that was really revealing. In the, uh, when I ask, um, what does home mean to you? And I guess in Spanish is hogar, which is very related to kind of the domestic space. I got just positive um, social relations, my family, love, not very interesting. And then actually, once we started working with photography, people were like, actually home and homemaking means so much more. And they started taking pictures of the city, taking pictures of other places, taking pictures. And it started revealing so much more. So I thought that, yeah, in terms of, of methodology for me, it was key in order to kind of unlock um, this idea of home that was much more than only what was linked mm -hmm. to the word. And then in terms of um, working interdisciplinary, I think that I'm, I'm a psychologist uh, as um, first. So because I've always worked on housing, I think for me, uh, interdisciplinarity has always been the case. And I've kind of been forced to learn. I've always worked with, with especially when I was uh, working um, to with with the Ministry of Housing, I've always had to work with architects and engineers and etc. So it was like almost like I was pushed to to work interdisciplinary. But I think in terms of my work, uh, it was impossible not to think about it in a in a in an interdisciplinary way because you, if you are trying to understand the meaning of home, you have to go to all the places in which home has been understood. So although I at the end I kind of base much more on, on the geography of home and what feminists have said about that, it, did, it wasn't enough to help me understand housing policy. So in that sense, I did work um, a lot with uh, Martin Heidegger's idea of, of dwelling, but also the, the critique that Iris Young makes to that, and in terms of uh, also considering uh, preservation and not just construction of the home. Um, and also, yeah, John Turner. So it was like, I think I, I at the end, mapped out quite, quite a big, um, kind of disciplines, just because I think it's not possible to just work from one to understand the complexity of home. I, I think that's very interesting. Um, Nitin? Uh, yeah, so I just uh, maybe wanted to bring it back to disciplinarity and um, I was thinking through um, why is it that uh, right now, you know, there are so many projects where um, you know, um, scientists try to collaborate with artists, and I'm sort of like thinking about the project of Anna Singh on the sort of arts of living on the damaged planet, and um, you know, it's a very similar kind of um, collaboration with artists and uh, you know, like artists of all kind, like kind of visual artists and filmmakers and uh, you know, scientists of all kind as well, and. Um, I think rather than sort of like being a crisis of sort of, you know, post, like kind of end of post-structural thinking, perhaps, um, I think it's quite generative that it sort of like uh, allows you not just to transcend, um, but rather create something in the process. And I think that was exactly um, my experience with Sumeda, where she sort of brought in this sort of um, walking, um, you know, kind of this, um, a little bit, uh, um, uh, sorry, Derive, Derive, yeah, Derive, and kind of you know storytelling and um, these kind of things, which allowed me to. Um, it was mutually constitutive, you know. It was not just uh, her translating my um, research ideas into sort of like an art project, but rather the art project affecting how I'm sort of like researching and creating uh scientific concepts um and i, I just wanted to maybe ask uh, ignacia like how like she collaborated um 
was did she collaborate um in sort of like you know this embroidery or other beautiful things that you did or like uh, i i didn't quite understand that part like how did you manage um yeah do you want me to answer or do you want to oh no please do please do ah um thank you yeah so i did an eight month um field work i lived in the settlement for two months of those eight months um and i had i also know the community for 15 years because i used to live in that city and work with them before and i continue to do so um and the workshops were although they were kind of defined by me in a way because it was for the phd we did though um define exactly how we were going to do them with them and actually in each community they ended up being a bit different because of the needs that they had so in one in one um, community we worked only with women because they already had that group and they they really wanted to continue sharing their experiences in that group and in the other one they were interested in getting different generations to work together so we worked um so though some of the things were prescribed by me, others were uh, defined by the community. Um, so we worked eight months on that. And because I've been, and now in 2020, we, they've been doing um, kind of a craft workshop that I've been joining online. Um, and that project of the embroidery was something that, um, although that was a national project that I was supporting, uh, they this craft group that had been set up at the beginning of lockdown because they felt very difficult to be in the house all the time. Um, especially because children weren't going to school, there was a rise in domestic violence, so they really felt that they needed this other space. Um, that's, and then they they decided to embroider for this um, for this project that is a separate project, um, and that was all done on on WhatsApp. Great, thank you very much. Um, I realise um, it's getting very late, um, so I'd like to open the conversation up to the audience as well and, and ask if there are any questions from anybody or any comments. Um, I know that there was one early on from uh, Morris, so uh, please go ahead. Um, uh, hi everyone, um, I, I thank you for your, all your presentations, are really, really interesting and, and very thought provoking. Um, I, my um, question is really, to everyone is that um, it seems to me that you're arguing that um, the work you do, the uh, art making um, and the questioning is all about the formation of relationships uh, between people and between people and things. Um, and, um, and therefore, when you are in an unsafe place if it, at home, you, you uh, rely on these relationships if you have them. Uh, to provide alternative safe places and therefore perhaps it's about an infrastructure of institutions making so in a city you uh, need institutions not just the home or the house uh, you need uh, other social infrastructure so perhaps the uh, making process is a relationship forming process which is the first part of making institutions um, which are larger than the home and smaller than the local authority um and i and i wonder i mean i know that um in the first presentation um we were talking about the academy as an alternative uh, or a group of makers is a becomes almost like a, a workshop or a place of work i mean uh, i always thought that my children should have at least three places they could go there's the family you know the the football club uh, perhaps or, or some other group that they were with or, or, the, or their friends in another group so that they weren't always trapped inside one set of, set of relationships or one institution if you call the family an institution and I wondered if that was all part of city making as much as home making so I'll stop there that's my question uh, is there a particular person you were hoping would respond uh, not particularly I mean I started with Tomato because she was mm -hmm. um, the, her collaborative making I think uh, spoke straight to that, but the other speakers later on also seem to overlap with that. So um, I don't know if Samada has got a, an answer to that idea. Yeah. I think it's really important um, to have these other, you wouldn't call them home spaces, but communities or, or spaces of 
I mean, maybe creation or activity or work, um, but they also, in a way, become safe spaces or sanctuary. I mean, for a lot of people, when home isn't um, being out in the field or being in a workshop or in a community center or in a crash or a school might be safer for someone than being at home. Um, so those are equally important. And and then home is not like what defines home? What are those relationships that define home? Um, the objects can move around. The rituals can move around. You can sit and drink tea somewhere or stitch somewhere else or make somewhere else. But what are those relationships then that feel like home? Because it's true. Um, you may feel more at home at your workspace than you do at home. Absolutely. Thank um, you. I, um, thanks, Morris. I see uh, John's got his hand up. John Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Um, very briefly, I just want to thank everybody for a really wonderful series of presentations and um, and also really to use this as an opportunity to um, advertise the Oral History Society's annual conference in 2022 is at London Met and it's on the theme of home. So I'd be really interested if any of the presenters or anyone else across the university is interested in putting a abstract and doing a presentation. It can be an oral verbal presentation or it can be something more creative like a photographic display or a theatrical performance around the theme of home pretty much across the range of different ways of thinking about have given us tonight i'm going i'd be really keen to um, establish some dialogue thank you Bo. thank you thank very you much everybody. um thank you for sharing that with us and for the invitation to the speakers to contribute to um to the event um i think it's a, a very fitting actually one of the themes that i felt came out of today's conversation was was also about storytelling um, and collective storytelling and how that contributes to the idea of home, particularly, um, you know, as we're talking about home beyond the domestic um, setting and, you know, home as, um, say, uh, gendered spaces, which become a home space and, and workspaces and, and so forth. Um, so, yes, thank you very much, John. I was going to say we could probably put the speakers in touch with you um, afterwards if anybody was interested in um, contributing to that. Thank you very much. Um, hi, hi Nick, you've got a question. Um, would you like to share it or would, or would you like me to read out your comment? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was I was literally about to go because my wife's <laughs> cooking something. So yeah, uh, it's a complicated observation, but I um, I was interested in um, it, the, the, the issue of the relationship between home and I guess the age of globalization, this whole question about being perennially displaced. So this idea in a sense that home is no longer about a place or Sandra's point about Heimat is really interesting, you know, in the sense of the context of the student in Belmonte actually finding his Heimat, finding his home. And it seems to me that's a really interesting question. Um, because I, I think that that perhaps is the is the central issue that probably we need to think about. Um, that is something that we almost need to event. It's, it's as much in our own imagination as opposed to actually a physical place. And that's the kind of question I was looking at um, in my inquiry. I, I was I was particularly interested in this idea of the act of stitching. Um, I was taken by this idea that that. Um, women in, who are themselves migrant workers construct out of the remnants of the process of the manufacture uh, a world. They construct a world, a geography of the world in quite a sophisticated way. So their sense of where they belong is actually no longer about a particular place, whether it's possibly in their imagination, but actually they're already 
embedded in this idea of a globalized world. They are manufacturers, they are makers of things that are distributed globally. So there's this kind of strange sense of almost permanent displacement, but homemaking happens in that world. It's no longer about a physical place anymore. And it's, I think, um, uh, Matthew's description of, you know, the shanty towns of South Africa uh, and having to move on, but having the kind of dignity of the space itself and the idea actually that the furniture becomes this kind of these mobile artifacts that you can just just install anywhere and everywhere becomes the basis of homemaking. So um, it reminds me of a quite an interesting debate uh, of a conference I went to many years ago it, it, on the subject of evolving globalization, where there was quite a dis, um, discussion about, um, or a conflict actually, disagreement about whether in fact place or the idea of home really exists anymore uh, and, and whether in fact we are all permanently displaced in in this world that we exist in that we don't really have a, a home anyway even even imaginary home where you you were born that no it seems to let matter less and less in our in our culture and our society Thank you very much, Nick. I, I see Samantha, you have a comment. And I, I think I'm going to make this the last comment um, so yes. we can all up so everyone can have some dinner. Uh, please go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Nick, um, so much. It's exactly what like has been coming up, right? So if um, what is the German word? Heimat. 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 Heimat is where you come from. And, and where you come from is not necessarily what you remember is home or can be otherworldly and not or is is like there is a permanent dispossession because or displacement or um it's like where are you from and and no one really knows how to answer that question anymore and definitely it's it's really about where is that home where do you come from um more than anything else and um and that's the big one for me. It's um, when your imagination or memory of home is is otherworldly or not rooted in this outer um, space, place, community, geography. Then where is home? And 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 are we just always trying to just create a nest or a sense of safety or sanctuary or belonging? And and that is beautiful um that is the human journey mm -hmm. thank you that's all i wanted to say um great well we're at time now we're five minutes over so um i think you're absolutely right um that homemaking is this sort of continually changing process that's constantly influenced by memory by the present and by imagining you know the future um so on that note thank you very but thank you every um very much everybody and all the speakers um, and everybody for attending uh, today's session um, and have a lovely evening. Um, take care. Bye bye. Thank Thanks you everyone. Thank you both for caring. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes.